Well, we praise God this morning for the privilege to walk in truth. You know, truth is um, truth is to be experienced. It's not it's not just knowledge. It's knowledge that is to be experienced. The truth of the, the, the knowledge of the truth, coming to the knowledge of the truth, the truth being a person. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can go unto the Father but by me. So in essence, what you're really doing is you're experiencing Jesus. You're not just getting a head full of knowledge. You're experiencing Jesus. Jesus is a person. Jesus is to be experienced. And you'll find that it is... Jesus, it is truth, it is the knowledge of the truth, this is how we are cleansed, we're cleansed by the truth, we're cleansed by the knowledge of the truth, it's an experience, you walk in truth, we are to walk in truth, not just try to uh, keep God's commandments from the outside. In other words, we're not trying to live by do's and don'ts. There are those that try to live by do's and don'ts, but that's not what Jesus that's not what Jesus provided for us through Calvary. Through Jesus Christ, through accepting him, we are walking in him. He is life. Jesus is life. And we live that out. We, we walk in life. We walk in his spirit. Truth. I think that's why a lot of folks today might think they're saved when they're not saved. It's because they have a thought that they're saved or they think they're saved. But they're not walking and experiencing what salvation really is. Salvation is to be lived. It's to be walked out. It's life. When I say it's life, I don't mean it's life in the sense that we live in this world. I mean it's life. It's a joy. It's Joy unspeakable and full of glory. I'm going to read a few scriptures to you. The scripture says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, Who will have all men to be saved, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. The knowledge of the truth. Something that is not the whole of. So, in other words, the essence of this knowledge, the truth. Knowledge comes from the truth. The truth is the source. The truth is a person. So we acquire this knowledge from the truth. The truth comes from, or the knowledge comes from the truth. So when you think about truth, you shouldn't be thinking about getting a head full of knowledge. You should have an understanding that you're experiencing he who is the truth. What a blessing. What a blessing to get to know Jesus. Now, we don't get to know him just a little bit. 
the scripture says we can know him in fullness that to be filled with the fullness that we can be rooted in Christ rooted and grounded in Christ and be filled with the fullness of God and you'll find that the closer you get the more deeper you go in God you'll find in the, the more deeper you go in the truth you'll find that there's a cleansing there's a, a deep cleansing that's taking place and you'll find that it's almost like you're experiencing the truth all over again almost daily it's just a continual regeneration it's a continual washing a continual cleansing and you may feel like on your surface you may say well I'm saved and you may say I'm on my way to heaven I'm saved sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost on my way to heaven but then God takes you deeper and you find that there's a resistance and you say where in the world did that come from how in the world can I be resisting him I love him I want to go to heaven I know I'm saved so why am I resisting him it's not you that's resisting him it's that nature it's that fallen nature that came from the fall that you still have that must must be removed and the only way for that nature to be removed is that we acknowledge the truth and it gets painful it gets painful the deeper we go the more we have to acknowledge the truth now I wrote down some things here and I hope it helps you as I begin to study this out last night the light begin to really come on and the knowledge of the truth we are not saved by a thought we are saved by knowledge of the truth it's the truth that saves us we do not think we are saved we know see God has something better for us than just just think we're saved well I think I'm saved no, we can know, Janosko, we can know intimately that we can know we are saved. How? By experiencing truth. We're in the truth. If we're walking in the truth and we're continuing to walk in the truth, then we're saved. But if we, but if we cease to walk in the truth, then we're outside the truth which is exactly what we see Jesus said about uh, Satan, about Lucifer. He abode not in the truth. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of himself because he is the father of lies. He abode not in the truth. That's how dangerous it is to stop walking in truth. You're outside the truth. You're not abiding in the truth. And over and over we see in the scripture Jesus talking about abiding. We have to come to the place where we, where we abide, not just hook up once in a while. There are those that will hook up at a, um, you know, a gospel convention or a revival service. They'll get hooked up, and then, and then they'll leave, and then they'll go out, and then they'll wait to get hooked up again at the next revival. But that's not what God has for us. He doesn't have us to, he doesn't desire that we plug in and, and unplug plug in unplug there is a place where we can come to where we abide in him but Jesus said in order to abide in him we must be purged he said the words I've spoken unto you they are the words that will purge you they will cleanse you and you are you will find this as you search and go deeper in God you will find that there are layers there are levels of yourself that have yet to be removed now when that is found out when the truth finds you out when you realize there's something there 
that's ugly. There's something there that's resisting God. You have a choice. You either going to let that thing resist God or you're going to reject it. How do you do that? By accepting the truth. By receiving the light. And as ugly as it seems, as ugly as it is, look at Isaiah. He's already a prophet of God. But he sees the Lord high and lifted up. He cries out, Woe is me. Now, we see that Job came into a place where he was, if I can find it here in the, Job came to a place where he said that he was searching for God. Oh, that I might find him, where I might come to where he is, where I might come to his seat, where I might argue with him, where I might... What was Job saying? Job says, I want to be delivered from my judge. Job had an argument. Probably the same argument David had when David said, Behold, Lord, I was shapen in iniquity. My mother conceived me. I, was, I'm in, I, I didn't have a choice. Now, if you're still living in that place where you're saying to God, I didn't have a choice, I don't have a choice, then you're still making excuses for your sin. You're still making excuses for why you sin. You don't need to make excuses because God has made a provision to be free. How do you get free? The truth. You shall know, Janosko again, intimacy you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free friend i wish that if you don't know already there is a place where you can walk in truth you can walk in the reality of deliverance you can walk in the reality of being free from sin free free from sin not having to um try to live by trying to live the word of God in your own strength. That's something that God never designed. He never, he ne it never came into the mind of God for us to try to live the truth without his help. He gives us the power to live within the truth. He doesn't just say, okay, I want you to uh, measure up to this, but I'm not going to give you the ability to do it. No, he says, I'm going to give you the ability to do it, but you have to make the choice you have to make the choice. Do you will to do it? Do you desire to do it? Do you want to do it? <clears throat> now, if you're still trying to obey God's word and you're trying to do it in your own strength, in your own self, then you're still living under the law. You haven't come to the understanding that you can receive his grace. You can receive his strength to walk in truth. There were those and there are those still today in 2 Timothy 3 7 it says they're ever learning ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And these that are never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, look what it says. Now as Jannies and Jamborees withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Doesn't say they resist uh, religion. Doesn't say they resist going to church. They resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. That's, this is the hour we are living in. 
when folks who are willing to go to church, they're willing to call themselves a Christian, but they will not receive the love of the truth. They resist the truth. They resist the truth. They don't want to walk in truth. They do not want to give up this world. They do not want to give up sin. They do not want to give up self. This is a, a, a joyous experience. If, if it's a drudgery to be a Christian, then you're not walking in truth. There's no way that you could be beaten with rods and rejoice if you're not walking in truth. There is an experience, if, if I can express that to you and help you to understand, there is a, there is a, listen to this, truth is spiritual. It is to be applied. It is to be walked in. It, I think the best way to understand walking in truth is to walk in the light. You're becoming light. You're, be, you're, you're experiencing. Um, the scripture says you're uh, partakers. You're partakers of the divine nature. You are partakers of his very essence, of his very nature. So therefore, he gives us his nature. So not only can we please him, but he gives us the ability to please him. If you're still trying to please him, and you keep falling short, it's because you're trying to please him without his nature. It's like instead of being on the inside, you're on the outside looking in. God has a place for you to be on the inside looking out. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. We must be in Christ. There's a place where we can be in Christ, where we can live, move, have our being in Him. Now, you can't be in Christ unless you have been drawn by the Lord to bring you to that place. No man can come to the Father but through Jesus. And you cannot come unless you're drawn. The Lord, and like the scripture says, lest the Lord builds the house, they that, lay, they that build the house labor in vain that build it. You can spend all kinds of time building, but what are you building? Paul said, take heed what you build on that foundation. He said, there is no other foundation but Christ. He says, but let every man take heed how or what he builds on that foundation. We must come to the knowledge of the truth that truth is to be walked in. It is to be experienced. And when you see people that are not joyous about serving Jesus, if, if there's not joy, if there's not joy in your spirit, if there's not joy in your heart, then you're not experiencing truth. There's no way you can experience truth and not have joy. You've got to have joy. You've got to, because that's the very essence of who God is. That's, that's his nature. If you, are, if, you are, if you say you're walking in the truth and you're not rejoicing and you're not experiencing his blessing, experiencing his peace, then you're not walking in truth. It's not about walking in an emotion, a feeling. Well, I feel happy today and now I don't. Or I feel happy right this minute, but now I don't feel happy. There is a consistent, um, there's a place where we can come to where it just stays the same. And it just, not that it stays the same in the sense that you don't, it doesn't get better, but it stays the same in the sense that it just, it just, it's consistent. It consistently gets better. But it should never go backwards. It should never, you should never be losing joy. You should never be losing peace. You should always be gaining as long as you're going forward in the Lord. And as you can tell, I'm carrying a burden. And, and my burden is, you know, that to see people struggling, trying to be Christians. This is not something we can try to be. This is, you can't. It's in fact, it's impossible to be a Christian. You cannot be a Christian 
You cannot be a Christian. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. He is the one that makes us Christ-like. That's what a Christian is. Christ-like or Christian means Christ-like. Being a Christian is not just a title. I'm a Christian. No. Christian means Christ-like, which means you have his likeness, which means you have his essence, which means you have his character. You are going to be acting as like Christ. If you have his nature, you won't have to say to people, I'm a Christian. If they ask you, you won't be ashamed to say you're a Christian, but you shouldn't have to run around saying to people, I'm a Christian. You shouldn't have to run around telling people you're a minister if you're really a minister. There's too much today where people are having to tell people what you shouldn't have to. They should see it. They should be able to see the light of Christ. They should be able to see the light of truth emanating from you. It should be something that they, being the people that are not even saved, should begin to experience what you're experiencing. Think about that for a moment. They should be actually, if they're drawn to the Lord through that, through, through that essence, through the nature of Christ, then they're going to begin to experience truth. So now not only are you experiencing truth, but now they're experiencing truth because truth is not just head knowledge. So in other words, you're not just sharing with people things you know. They're experiencing the one you know the one who you know. They're going to experience his presence. They're going to experience himself. Does that make sense? So here you are, say for example, you're on the street and you're walking down the street and all of a sudden somebody just all of a sudden begins to just talk to you out of the blue. And you're saying, and you're saying in yourself, you're saying, why are they talking to me? Why are they pouring out their heart to me? Because they experiencing the truth. The truth makes you free. They feel free around you so they can express themselves, so they can open up their hearts, so they can talk. But listen, friend, they're not talking to you. You think they're talking to you, but they're not talking to you. They're pouring out their heart because they're, get, they're, they're experiencing truth. So if everybody that ever comes up to you starts pouring out their heart and you get nervous because they or or if you're selfish and you won't let them pour out their heart, then you're not allowing them to experience the truth. I've had times where I'm at work and and all of, just out of the blue someone will say to me um just start talking. They'll just start talking. They'll say, "Well, I'm I, I'm I'm having too much fun." I had my boss's son one time said just out of the blue, we were just putting away things and he just all of a sudden just blurted out, I'm having too much fun. And because I wasn't experiencing the truth like he was, I and I wasn't mature enough to understand what was going on, I didn't say anything to him, but I looked back and I was like, what, what? And see, I wasn't, with, I wasn't in a place where, like a fisher of man, where I, you know, where I could minister to him. Because God could have gave me the wisdom or the knowledge to speak to him. But it, but that initiation, it wasn't me initiating him opening up and pouring out his heart. It was Jesus that was initiating him to get him to open his heart. Remember what the scripture says? It says a man will fall down, come into a congregation where the truth is. He'll fall down and report of a truth that God is in us. He says, but if he comes in and hears you all speaking in tongues, he'll think you're a bunch of idiots or think a bunch of nuts because he'll, he'll think that you're a bunch of crazy people. But he said, Paul said, I, I'd rather that you speak just a few words, just a few words in truth than to be babbling in another tongue that nobody knows. Please understand what Paul was saying. Paul was saying, look, if you're just speaking in other tongues and you're just, you know, having an emotional trip, that's not going to help that person that's coming off the street that's never experienced truth. But if you're a mature body, if you're mature, then you are worshiping God. You, you are experiencing the truth himself, Jesus Christ. You're experiencing truth when somebody comes in and feels his presence, experiences the truth, and he falls down and he begins to uh, 
uh, pour out his heart, then someone is there to lead him, to guide him, to help him. Folks, we're coming into a time where the presence of God, where the scripture says, arise and shine for thy light is come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. There are going to be people that are going to just going to cry out for help. Men and brethren, what should we do to be saved? And we got to have enough knowledge, enough, enough maturity to be able to give them an answer. Now, we don't see uh, how much, we don't know how far that went, but we see that Peter said, um, repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. They were asking. They, they were experiencing truth. They were experiencing the Lord. And because they were experiencing the Lord, they poured out their heart. They cried out, men and brethren, what should we do to be saved? What should we do to be saved? They, they were crying for the they, they didn't even understand altogether what they were being saved from. All they knew is that they needed to be saved. Now, I had, my wife had told me that, uh, that she was driving along in the car and the Lord spoke audibly to her and said, you need to give your life to me. Well, God doesn't have to speak audibly. He shouldn't have to. Depends on what, you know, where we are and how proud we are and how self-righteous we are, I guess. But the Lord just being his presence alone. Look at, before the Lord even said anything to Saul, Saul cried out, Lord, who art thou? See, before he got, before Jesus said a word, Saul's already crying out to him, Lord, who art thou? He knew he was the Lord just by being in his presence. Nobody had to tell Saul, you are in the presence of the Lord of the universe. You're in the presence of the God of the universe. You are in the presence of your creator. No one had to tell him that. But he didn't intimately personal relationship he didn't know who he was he knew his presence he was experiencing the truth but he didn't know who he was and he said i'm jesus whom thou persecutest now he's putting it together wait a minute that's the jesus that these are the people i've been persecuting you got to just understand how low that took him you got to imagine how much that must have just broke him down I mean, here's the very one that he's been persecuting, the very one he was against. He was against and in, in, imprisoning the, the followers of this one that is now speaking in, in an audible voice to him and saying, I'm Jesus whom thou has been persecuting. Saul, why are you persecuting me? Do you understand what I'm saying, folks? We are coming into a time where people are going to sense his presence. They're going to sense his essence of who he is. And we have got to be in a place where we can lead and guide them into all truth. How do we do that? It's not you and I doing it. It's we're willing to open our mouth. And if we've been feeding on the truth and putting the truth in our hearts, the Holy Spirit has something to work with. If we don't put something in our heart, then the Holy Spirit has nothing to use. He has nothing to operate with. And so, yes, he can speak through us without us pouring it into our heart. Yes, he can speak through us. But there is a place. And maybe you don't understand this, but there is a place where we can go beyond being just oracles of God in the sense that God speaks through us. We can come to the place where we become discernful and how to how does the, how did Paul say it Paul said not only rightly dividing the word of truth but also we are skillfully learning how to skillfully in other words it's like the Lord said to me he said learn to wield the sword of truth for it is by the sword of truth that you make men free. Wait a minute. Wield the sword of truth, Lord? 
You mean, you mean that I'm supposed to have a part in this? I thought that I was just going to open my mouth and you'd speak through me and then that would be it. No, I want you to learn to be a soldier. I want you to learn to be a warrior. I want you to learn how to wield the truth. In other words, to be skillful with the word of knowledge. In other words, you don't share with people, just blurt out and share with people um, everything you know because you may chase them away. We think that God does it all. We think it's, it's God does everything. There is a place. It's like a hand in a glove. Does that make sense? It's like a hand in a glove. And look at it this way. God's the glove, and you're putting your hand in the glove, okay? You're in Christ. Well, think about it. That glove and that hand are going to do the same thing. When, when, you, when you move your finger, the glove moves its finger. But this is what I want you to understand, is that even though you're in Christ, and, and you may think in the natural and say, I'm moving my finger, so therefore the glove is moving with my finger. It's just the opposite. Even though you're in Christ, the glove moves first. You ever thought of it that way? The glove is moving before the finger does. So though, even though you're in Christ and in the natural, when you move your finger, the, 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 the glove that you have on your hand, the, the, the glove moves with the finger as the finger moves. Remember, in the, you are that hand in the glove. However, in Christ, he moves first. You move with him. Now, this couldn't happen if you were outside the glove. If your hand was outside the glove, you couldn't experience. That wouldn't happen. What you may not understand is in the fall, Adam and Eve, when they disobeyed God, in the fall, everything became reversed. Instead of the spirit being in control under the headship of God, Everything became reversed, and the body was in control. The soul, the soul died. There was no relationship between you and God. So there you have a dead soul, and you have a body. No wonder. Think about it. No wonder, our, no wonder we were prisoners. No wonder we were slaves. Whatever the devil wanted us to do, he would do it. He would just operate through the soulish realm, and our soul was dead. We were dead in our sins. But through regeneration and being born again, what happens? God puts things back in order the way they were supposed to be. The spirit is first. The soul is second. But now there's a difference. The soul is not only second. The soul is alive. You're a living soul. Remember, when God breathed into Adam, became a living soul. That We lost that in the garden. Now, through being born again, that soul is being brought to life. So now you get your spirit, soul, and body. Now you'll find if you listen to any New Ager at any time at all, you'll find that what they're doing is putting body, soul, and spirit. But they're, remember, their soul is dead, so they're still in the soulish realm, and they're being moved into the spirit, which the spirit is Satan. They think they're making progress when they're really not making any progress at all. In fact, they're going deeper and deeper and deeper into prison. And this is the way the Lord showed it to me. He said, my people are becoming conscious of me instead of self-conscious. He said, the devil's followers are becoming more and more conscious of themselves. But he even takes them beyond self-consciousness to where they think they're conscious of themselves when they're really conscious of Satan. Think about that for a moment. <clears throat> further and further and further into darkness. Now, as we as believers in Christ are experiencing truth, they're experiencing the lie. They're experiencing, they're literally experiencing the nature of the beast. No wonder they're worshiping the beast. No wonder they're, they're following the beast. No wonder the scripture says they worship the beast. Because the very nature of the beast they have turned to. They are, they are con completely absorbed in the nature of the beast. That's what, what we all received in the fall. 
The fall, we all receive that nature of the beast. But thank God, amen, for Jesus, that he went to Calvary, he made a way where there was no way, he is the door, he's the gateway, we come through Jesus. How do we come through Jesus? We come through the truth. He is the truth. Wait a minute, you can't come through the truth. Why can't you? Because you must receive the knowledge of the truth first. And that is the essence of the truth. And that is what the devil does not want you to receive. He does not want you to have the knowledge of the truth. If you have the knowledge of the truth, you begin to experience the truth. And he doesn't want you to experience the truth. That's why he does his best to even pervert the scriptures. He does his best to pervert the Bible. He does his best to pervert ministers so that when they give the message from the pulpit or they're sharing the truth, it's mixed. There's a mixture. Because he does not want you to experience truth. He doesn't want you to come to Jesus. He doesn't want you to come to a knowledge of the truth. I hope that you understand what, what I'm trying to share with you. Truth is to be experienced. It's spiritual. Truth is spiritual. It's not physical. It's not something that you fill up your head with. It's to be experienced. It is to be walked in. And John said... Let me read to you what John said. He was talking about walking in the truth. And he says, I rejoiced greatly. Think about what he's saying here. John says, I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth. Nothing thrills the heart of a minister more is to see folks walking in the truth. And nothing burdens the heart of a minister more to see people trying to live right or trying to live for Jesus and not be walking in the truth. Nothing, nothing breaks the heart more is to see people struggling and wanting to be happy, but they're not happy. Nothing gets a hold of me more when I see people not happy when they can be happy when they're trying to be happy and they can't be happy because they're not walking in happy. Does that make sense? <laughs> we can literally walk in happiness. We can walk in happy. We can walk in the truth. We can walk in the essence of the truth. But Jesus is to be experienced. And if we're experiencing Jesus, then others around us will experience Jesus. Now, that doesn't, that's not always a positive effect. <laughs> not, not everybody is always going to enjoy uh, experiencing the truth. Some will hate him. Um, but we thank the Lord for those that do accept the truth and those that will experience the truth. We've heard of testimonies where Smith Wigglesworth will be on a train and he's not talking to a soul. He's not talking to anybody. He's just on a train going from here to there. And then people will just start pouring out their hearts and just saying, I'm a sinner. What do I need to do? I'm, I'm a sinner. And if there's nobody that's around that can give that person direction, then that person's just going to know they're a sinner and they will not get anywhere. They'll just have the knowledge that they're of sin. Well, the knowledge of the sin but comes by the law. That's where the knowledge of sin comes from. But Jesus said, the law came by Moses. I want to take you beyond the law. I want to take you to where? The truth. He doesn't want us to just not have knowledge of sin. It's not enough to have knowledge of sin. We need a Savior. Amen? What is it, what is it that if, if people are crying out, what should I do to be saved, and there's no one to lead them to Jesus, no one to say to them, repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they don't know what to do. I mean, these are people that are completely vulnerable. They're just saying, I know, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I acknowledge I'm convicted. I am in trouble. I know I'm in trouble. But what do I do? What, tell me what to do. And so Peter, being full of the Holy Ghost, he says, 
believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Folks, that is the essence. That is the ministry. That is where we are not. That's where the church is not living today. We're not living in that place. If we were living in that place, folks would get saved. We would see people being added to the church. And remember, it's not you and I that add to the church. The scripture says as much as the Lord would add to the church. Fear came upon the church. Great fear came upon the church, but it was as the Lord led and as the Lord drew by his spirit, people were being added to the church. There's nothing more exciting to see people that are coming to church because they were brought there by the Lord, not because somebody manipulated them, not because somebody made them feel bad or um, tried to win them to, to God through fear. There are people today that are serving Jesus out of fear. That is so unhealthy. That is discouraging. That makes people, that, I'm bored. I, I don't even want to be here. Because you're not there for the right reason. No wonder people don't come and gather together to worship the Lord. They're not coming to worship. They're coming because they're afraid if they don't come to church, they're going to go to hell. That's not the truth, folks. That's not experiencing Jesus. That's not what he provided through Calvary. He is giving to us his life. He laid down his life at Calvary. He gives us his life. He pours his life into us. He, he wants he desires that we experience Him, that we walk in Him, that we experience joy, we experience peace. If we were experiencing Jesus, more people would desire to have Him. But we're not. Folks, I'll tell you, we are not experiencing Jesus. We're not walking in the truth. If folks are not desiring to come to Jesus and desiring to be saved, then we're not walking in truth. Because you can't tell me everybody in the world does not want to be saved, that somebody in this world would not come to Jesus if one of us Christians was walking in truth. We're not seeing souls being saved a whole lot today. And that's because we're not walking in truth. That's because we're not walking in and experiencing the truth. And I'm going to say this again, as, as, as redundant as it sounds. Truth is to be experienced. Why are you so happy? Truth. You may say Jesus to them, and that's going to throw them off because, well, I know, I, I've heard of Jesus, and I, I've experienced Jesus. No, but, but Jesus said, I am the truth. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus didn't say, I'm Jesus. Are you listening? He said that to Saul of Tarsus, but Jesus over and over was pouring out the essence of who he was. He didn't want them to know him on the outside. He didn't want them to know him from the physical. He wanted them to know. He didn't say, I'm Jesus. Uh, son, uh, I'm Jesus. Uh, my, my, my dad is Joseph and, and my mother is Mary. He didn't say that. What did he say? What, what did Jesus say? When he said to Peter, he says, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? He didn't tell Peter who he was. He said, whom do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Because he wanted them to experience him. He wanted them to, that's why he said, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life in you. That's why he said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's why he said to the woman at the well, he said, if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. He wanted them to know him as God. He wanted them to know him as God. He didn't want them to know him in the physical. He didn't want them to know him as a human being. He wanted them to know him as the truth, as God of heaven, as the son of God. He wanted them to know the father. He wanted them to know God. That's why he came. Now listen to this, folks. The world, if they, even if they don't admit it, they think God hates them. They think God is angry with them. We'll share that in the next broadcast. I want you to understand something from the truth of God's word about this idea that God is angry. Because there is a misconception today about God being angry. We need to have an understanding of the truth the knowledge of the truth. 